All right, now in, in Psalm 17, I'm just going to be focusing in on one of the verses here. Verse number 3 says, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me, and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So it's really the latter part of that verse I'm going to be preaching on. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Do you see, this is something that, this is going to apply to everybody in the world, this sermon tonight. I don't care who you are, there's, there's, we all have an issue with the words that come out of our mouth. And we're going to get, I'm going to get into this a lot more in detail, but there's a lot of sinning that happens through the mouths of people, and oftentimes they don't even realize it. And we're going to get into a lot of, a lot of um, what the Bible says about what, how we should be speaking and, and the things that should be coming out of our mouth. Now, the first place that we're going to look at is um, in Job chapter number 2. You don't have to turn there if you like. You could actually turn to James chapter 3 if you would. James is right near the end of the New Testament. We're going to spend some time in James chapter number 3. Pretty close to the end of the Bible, James chapter 3. It's right after the book of Hebrews. Um, but in Job chapter 2, the Bible reads, But he said unto her, and this is, okay, if you remember, I was just a, just a quick synopsis of Job. If you remember the story of Job, Job was a man that, the Bible says he was, he was perfect and upright in heart. There was not a man like him in all the earth. Basically, he was the best man living in his time. Like, just righteous, I mean, living according to what God wants him to do, and just living a really good life. And, you know, Satan was accusing him before God, and just saying, oh, yeah, you know, the only reason he's serving you, and the only reason he's doing anything good is because you're protecting him. You know, he's saying, oh, you've made his life so nice, yeah, take away this stuff and he'll curse you. That's what, that's what, the, and that's what the devil does, by the way, he's an accuser. He's out accusing the brethren and just, just speaking lies and trying to get us in trouble, you know, and always trying to mess things up. And God allows, he says, okay, God's going to prove Job. He's going to allow this to happen and he's proving him. And what, so what happens is the devil give, gets permission to go and, and do things, but he said, well, you know, just don't, don't touch Job like his body. Just, you can do whatever you want, but don't, don't harm Job himself. So he goes and Job loses, I mean, he loses all of his wealth. He was a wealthy man. He had all his livestock, you know, cattle, all these different things. Loses all of it. And then, um, and, and all these things happen in succession. Like, like these people come and tell Job, like, Job, we we're just out watching the flock. And like this fire came down from heaven and just devoured everything. And you know, another guy comes and says, yeah, these people came and raided us and stole all your stuff. And only I'm here left. And it gets bad news after bad news after bad news. I mean, just like his entire world falls apart until finally, like the last one that comes is that all ten of his children were eating in in a house in one house together, and you know, there's a whirlwind came and the house fell on top of them and killed all of his children. And that was like the final blow, and it was just like it just came boom, 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 one after another. So he's hit with all this tragedy and all this sadness, and just I mean, his world just completely turned upside down, right? And the Bible says, even through all of that, he didn't sin, he didn't say, he didn't charge God foolishly, he didn't do anything wrong. So then the devil goes back to God, you know, and God's like, hey, you know, basically you were wrong. Did you see my servant Job? You know, even after all this stuff, he's, he's still, he still retains his integrity, he's still, um, he's still an upright man. And the devil said, oh yeah, well, you know, the stuff that he has, you know, if he touches, you know, if he touches flesh, you know, then, then he'll curse you to your face. And basically what he's saying is, yeah, okay, when people can lose stuff and things, but if you cause them to have poor health, you know, then it'll be a different story. Again, Satan just falsely accusing Job. So, God allows it to happen, and Job gets covered with boils from head to toe. I mean, he's just itching, he's just miserable, he's lost everything, and now he's got this, this disease, these boils, just all over his body, you know, he's just sitting in sackcloth and ashes and just, just miserable. I mean, completely miserable. So his wife comes up to him, basically, and is just like, you, you, know, you still retain your integrity? And she says, curse God and die. And that's her response to him. So it's like, not only does, you know, is everything else going wrong, now his wife's like not even encouraging him at all. Like it's just, 
really, I mean, as, as low of a point as you can possibly get. I, I, I don't know. It, it's a, it's, he went through a lot, but this is what, um, what we see then in Job 2.10. This was his response to her. He says, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. So this is the first sin that I want to talk about with our lips and with our mouth, is basically charging God foolishly, right? All of these things that happened to Job is not God's fault that they happened. The devil was the one attacking him, okay? God may have allowed it to happen. He didn't step in and intervene. But God wasn't the one that was that was literally putting him through this stuff. And it wasn't it wasn't anything that Job did that was wrong. Job was doing everything right. But see, sometimes we go through trials, we go through temptations, and God wants to really know what's in our heart and kind of prove it. And makes us prove things by, um, by going through difficult times. And if we can retain our integrity, we'll come forth true. But see, what a lot of people do when they sin with their lips is that they will try, they'll, they'll just say, oh, how could God, you know, allow this to happen? And they'll start blaming God for things that happen and for sins that happen, sins that people commit against other people. And yeah, I understand. There's a lot of horrible things going on out there. I mean, this world is full of wickedness and people are getting hurt and there's a lot of tragedies in this lifetime. But it's foolish to blame it on God and to say that God's the one that's causing those things to happen and say, well, where is God? And just... You know, throw up your hands and, and um, basically just accuse God for things that happen or blame him for not stepping in. I mean, I know a friend that was saying, well, you know, his girlfriend's grandfather died. And he said, well, she loved him so much. And he's like, I would have done anything and taken his place for him because she loved him so much. How could God just allow him to die like that? It's like, well, I mean, first of all, everybody dies. And second of all, I mean... You know, that's just charging God foolishly. You're, you're talking to someone who doesn't understand everything that's going on. And um, it's something that we shouldn't do. And that's why the Bible is careful to say that Job didn't sin with his lips. Because he could have sinned. He could have, he could have cursed God and died like his wife was asking him to do. He didn't curse God. He didn't, he didn't blame God for the things that were happening. He said he didn't know why it was happening, but... He wasn't just charging God. I mean, when he lost all of his goods, he said, naked came I into this world, and naked shall I return thither. You know, basically, you can't, you know, God is, God is um, given and God is taken away. You know, he, he, he's, all the things that he had, he knew that God gave it to him. The Bible says, every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights. We receive good things at God's hand, so if God takes them away from us, hey, I mean, he gave it to us in the first place, he takes it away, okay, well... I was doing good for a while, and now he's taken away, fine. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's the attitude we ought to have instead of charging God foolishly. You're in James chapter 3. We're going we're to read a lot of this chapter. Look at verse number 1. Because this talks a lot about the tongue and, and about how dangerous it is and how powerful our tongues are. James chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in the word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So we say, look, if you don't offend in word, you're perfect. You're a perfect man. If you, can, if you can control your mouth that much to where you're not offending in word, you're a perfect man. It says, and able also to bridle the whole body. And he ex explains what we talking about with bridling the whole body. In verse 3, it says, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ship's which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. So he's saying, look, you can control a horse by putting that bit in their mouth and just pulling on it one way or the other. You can control what direction they do. You can control a lot of things about the horse. Same thing with this huge boat. It's a massive vessel that goes on the sea. And then, but the rudder, I mean, comparatively, is really small. And you just turn that a little bit this way or that, and that controls the direction of this huge, this huge thing. So he's saying, if you can control your tongue, you can control the whole body. You bridle your tongue and control that. Hey, man, you got control over your entire body. Look at verse number five. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, 
This is warning us about how powerful the tongue really can be. Because you think about it, you know, the analogy that they use, the illustration that they use here is a fire, right? So you think about like these huge forest fires that happen out here, especially like in the Prescott area in Arizona. I mean, these devastating fires that just consume just, I mean, I don't even know how much land it is, just acres and acres, just hundreds or thousands of acres just getting burned up. And you hear about how they start sometimes and they figure it out like, oh, it just started from a campfire. You know, it's one person having some small, some small little fire in their campsite turns into this great matter, this huge, huge, devastating forest fire that consume people's houses and people die and all, you know, I mean, there's all this great destruction and it all started with one little fire, one little, one little thing or a cigarette butt going out the window, right? I mean, you hear about that happening in California. They have the, the, the brush fires on the side of the road that just consume just huge fields and um, I mean, it's crazy how much that little fire, and, it's, and, it, and look at what it's doing here, is that it's likening that to your tongue. You got to be careful of the things that come out of your mouth because even a little, even just some words that you don't give much thought to can, can start spiraling out of control and cause a great matter and a great problem that, 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 kind of illustrates the power of just our mere words. Just the words that come out of your mouth have, can, can have a huge impact like this. Look at verse number six. It says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Iniquity is sin. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Just as if you could control your, your tongue, control your mouth, you could control your whole body. Hey, if your mouth is speaking evil things, if you don't have your mouth under control, that can cause your whole body to be in sin. That's going to lead you into other things. I mean, you think about it. Something like the sin of fornication, for example, is a sin of your body. But how are you going to get to that point? You're going to get to it through those, through those words coming out of your mouth. When you start flirting with that other person and, and it starts building up into something that shouldn't be. Hey, watch your mouth. You shouldn't even be getting started down that path with your mouth. If you don't do that with your mouth, hey, you'll be able to keep your body from, that extra, from those sins. And you can see how just a little, a few words, a few of the wrong words, a, few, a little innuendo can go a long way and kindle a great matter. Watch your mouth. Watch the things that you say. Be very careful. Don't say things flippantly. Verse number seven, for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Again, the, the Bible uses a lot of strong language in different places about different things. Pay attention to those times when it uses that strong language because God's trying to call our attention. Hey, look, pay attention to this. This is important. I mean, you're you know, full of deadly poison and unruly evil. Those are not light words. It's using this to, to make us be aware of this and be conscious of this truth that we need to give heed to the things that come out of our mouth and really think about these things before we open up and speak. Verse number nine says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So he's saying, look, you can have one mouth. On one, on one hand, your, your, your mouth is praising God, you're blessing people, you're saying good things, but then out of the same exact mouth, you're cursing people, you're talking evil about people. And he says, hey, these things ought not so to be. You ought not to be doing that. It should only be the good things. You shouldn't have both things coming out of your mouth. Verse 11 says, doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brother, and bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So we need to show a good conversation, our works, and have that meekness of wisdom. Wisdom is going to give you, have, give, let you have an humble heart and um, will not allow you to speak boastfully or proudly. And, um, you know, he's telling us here that we need to have a good 
conversation. Now, go ahead and turn, if you would, well, yeah, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 5. We are already there earlier this morning. We are going to read the first part of that. We read the second part earlier. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 tells us something else that we need to watch out for when we're, when we're speaking and when we're talking. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start reading verse number 3. The Bible says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So he's talking about here, we ought not to be talking about our sins, whether they be present or past. I mean, he's saying, he says, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Don't be talking about the sins you've done in the past. Don't be reveling and glorying in your days when, oh man, I used to go out, you should have seen the amount of women that I had just talk about all this stuff and these days when you were living in filth and fornication. The Bible says that doesn't become saints. You're saved. You're sanctified. You're washed from those sins. Don't be glorying in them. Don't be speaking of them. Don't be talking about them. And honestly, there's no reason to be talking about it. That's why when I, you know, I talk to people at the door and I try to relate to them and say, look, I've sinned too. I've done wrong. I, you know, I've done some things. I don't like getting into them because I don't even like rehashing the past and just talking about some of the things I used to do. There's no point to it. Now, I'll, I'll, Go, I'll tell them a little bit just because I want to relate to them and, and just show them, hey, look, I'm a sinner too. I've done wrong. But I'm not going to go in there and be like, oh, man, you should have seen the amount that I can drink. And you know what? People, Christians do that. Christians will boast and brag about, oh, man, I can tell you what, I can hold down my liquor and no, you know, no one can outdrink me and all this other stuff. It's nonsense, it's vanity, and it's foolishness. We ought not to be talking about those things. And that's what it says in verse 4 here, Ephesians 5, 4, it says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of, God, of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So, so look. Because of these things that you're talking about, because of this, you know, the, the whoremongering and the covetousness, the uncleanness, the fornication, hey, the wrath of God is coming out of people for that. Don't glory in it. Don't, don't talk about them like it's, like it's something cool. And don't, be, don't even be, um, you know, foolish talking and jesting about it. Don't be joking about it. You know, it's not a joke. I, I, I'm sick of the, you know, and this is, this is one of the reasons why sodomy, why homosexuality is accepted today. It's because it started off as a joke. It started off being introduced on TV as, as oh yeah, they're just funny, ha ha ha, they're laughing. We ought not to be making a joke of that wicked sin. We ought not to just be laughing at it because when you laugh at it, it's going to soften up your heart into thinking, oh, this is okay. We don't joke about our sins and the, and, and the wickedness that, you know, like God points it out as being extremely wicked. We ought not to just be making light of it by joking about it, by jesting about it, and by just foolishly talking about these things. It's not what God has, has called us to do. We're sanctified. We're supposed to be separated from these things and keeping our conversations pure. Psalm 50, 23, you don't have to turn there. says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. So you're just saying we ought to be praising God. That glorifies God when we, when we praise God, when we give him the credit, when we talk to people. You know, you know, things are going your way. Hey, glory to God. Thanks be to God. God help me with this. And him that ordereth his conversation. You think about it. You order it aright. You don't just say the first thing that, that comes to mind. You order your conversation. You think about it and, and you, the words that come out of your mouth have already been thought about and put into place. And then in uh, Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So again, another thing. And this was already mentioned in Ephesians 5, what we read. I'm going to point out now though. Don't be talking about the things that you want that you can't have. That's a sin. All of these things. Look. 
we need to control the things that we talk about because the more you talk about it, the more you're going to be thinking about it. And it's kind of a cycle. You're thinking about it, you're going to talk about it. You talk about it some more, you'll be thinking about it. And then you're going to find people to talk about it to you again. You bring up a conversation, someone else is going to come back to you and just, just continue it. It's going to perpetuate it. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's likened to fire. Because when I start talking to you about something, now all of a sudden I'm thinking about it and you're thinking about it. You can come back to me about it and say, hey, I was talking to Pastor Burzins and he said this. And you tell it to someone else. And you can see how just one, th one <laughs> stupid thing that comes to your mind, something covetous, whatever it is, you know, comes to your mind and, you, and you, you open up your mouth and just start talking about it. It's infectious. It spreads. It's going to get around to other people. Very important to watch out and, and you know, keep your conversation without covetousness. We ought not to have a covetous heart anyways. And the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We need to work on our hearts so that we're not, these things aren't coming out of our mouth. But also, you know, the whole, the whole goal of this sermon, I'll tell you right now, we're not, even, we're not close to being done yet, but the whole goal is that I really want people to, to take a step back in everything that you say and have a filter in your mind before you open up your mouth and say things. Now, there's times where emotions can run high. And people can say things foolishly out of anger or out of grief or out of... I mean, there's, there's different reasons why people end up saying things. You know, a lot of times people say things that are very hurtful, especially in arguments and in fights. People will say things they don't really mean, but it can be very hurtful. And that's a lack of having the proper filter on your mouth. That's something that we all need to work on. But, I mean, it's true... Once something comes out of your mouth, you can't retract it. You can't take it back. It's already gone out. The damage that it's, that it's going to do, it's going to do. You, there's no taking it back once it comes out of your mouth. So it's really, really important to, to try to train yourself, train your mind to have this filter so that you're not just saying anything that comes to your mind. And here's the thing. If it means you just talk a little bit less, that's okay. <laughs> A lot of people have a tendency to talk a little bit too much. And we're going to see what Proverbs has to say about that. But um, un at least until you can get that filter in place, it's important. This is, this is a big deal. Um, you know, sinning with our lips. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.15, it says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. All of our conversations, everything we talk about, ought to be holy. The things that are coming out of your mouth... Compare it to God. Would God call the things that you're talking about? Would He say that those are holy? Are they clean? Are they separate? Is, is are the words that you're speaking and the conversations that you're getting involved with? Would God be okay with that? Would God be satisfied? I mean, just think about that personally. Just in all manner of your conversations, that's the standard that we need to use. Is what I'm saying right now? Is God gonna be angry with me for even thinking about it or talking about it or saying it? Very good. A very good level of standard to use. Just in general, when you have your conversations. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So the Bible's telling us here, now, not only do we have to you know, stay away from talking about those sins and talking about the, the filth and all the other things. Hey, keep your conversation honest. Don't be telling lies, right? He wants us to be honest among the Gentiles. Well, honest among the Gentiles is, good, you know, basically, um, you know, against the, uh, against the uh, towards the, the world, the unsaved. Because people are going to be looking at you. They know you're a Christian. They're going to be looking to attack you. And that's why I said, like, they speak against you as evildoers. So they're saying, look, they're out there, just they're spreading lies about you. You need to keep your conversation, your communication honest. Because then they'll have no way to reproach you. They'll have nothing to say, oh man, yeah, this guy's just a liar. Because they'll jump on the one thing that you say that's wrong. And that the, you know, whatever comes out of your mouth that you shouldn't be speaking, they're going to jump on you. And that's going to give a false, a, a, a poor testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that they know you're saved. And they hear these things that are coming out of your mouth and say, oh, well, this person's saved. Why are they talking about that? Why are they lying? And rather, what it should be is what he's saying here, that they may, by your good works, hey, if you're doing what's right, and if you're speaking what's right, it says, they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So when people come by and give them the gospel, hey, 
they can see, well, this is what a Christian's doing. I, you have nothing to say against them. Because they're living uprightly, they're doing what's right. There's no reproach and there's no shame given to, to Christ's name because you're doing what's right and you're saying things that are honest. Second Peter chapter number two talks about Lot. Now, of course, Lot was the man who was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was saved. The Bible says that he was a righteous man. He was saved. He believed on God. But he was living in Sodom. He was living in that city, and he was there before God rained fire and brimstone on the faggots that lived in that town because he was so sick and disgusted of their vile ways. God poured out and destroyed an entire city because of the filth and wickedness that they had gotten into. And the Bible says about Lot, it says that, and he delivered just Lot, saying he was a just man, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So the Bible saying he was vexed. His soul, he had problems. He was vexed. He didn't like hearing about this stuff. It bothered him. It sickened him because their, their conversation was filthy. It was wicked. And it bothered him a lot. And here's the thing. First of all, don't choose to be around people that are going to be vexing your soul. Lot should not have been in Sodom. He should not have been just dwelling among all those people to where it got to the point where God just rains fire and brimstone down on them. If that's the case, get out of there. They shouldn't be your friends. They shouldn't be the people you're always hanging around with and spending time with. Don't have don't don't be around that. If you're watching a movie and something vexes your soul, you hear something, don't watch that garbage. And it should bother you, by the way, when you hear filth, when you hear these filthy conversations, it ought to bother you. It ought to bother your spirit. You ought to hear those things and be like, man, I don't want to hear about that. And don't choose to be around those conversations. And you better not be the one vexing other people with your conversation. It's another reason to watch what comes out of your mouth. Proverbs 14, 9 says, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Again, this goes back to one of my other points about mocking, just making jokes about sin, you know, saying something like, Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, best words are going to go out and get drunk after service or something like that. You know, I realize maybe someone would say something like that just trying to be funny and trying to be humorous. But the Bible says, Fools make a mock at sin. It's not a mockery, it's not a joke, okay? God has serious punishment. God has this punishment of hell on our sins. It's not a laughing matter. It's not something we should be joking about. Hey, there's lots of things that we can joke about and have fun with. Okay, I'm not trying to be a stickler and saying you can't laugh. Um, you can't have a good time. You can't. You don't smile. No, don't smile. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying at all. But we don't have to be joking about sin. We don't have to be to be a fool and just making a mock out of sin. Because it is important, it is serious. I mean, I wouldn't be standing up here tonight preaching this sermon if it wasn't serious. I mean, I, you know, I'm preaching this sermon because it is serious. I mean, it's something that we all need to pay attention to and watch because God treats sin seriously and we ought not to be, to be doing wrong by God. Proverbs 10 verse 18 says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. And this is exactly what I was talking about, getting that filter in place in your mind to not just speak. And what it's saying here in the multitude of words, so it's saying when people who just talk a lot and a lot and a lot, people just, just keep on talking, excuse me, it says there wanteth not sin. What wanteth means, it means basically there's not lacking sin, sins there. Um, it says, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You learn how to refrain your lips, learn how to say some things and not say some other things. The Bible says, then, then you're wise. Verse 20 says, the tongue of the just is as choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. Get that filter in place. And, um, you know, like the Bible saying, you know, the, more, the more you're flapping your lips, the more likely it is that you're, that you're sinning with your lips. Just out of the, the, the volume of the things that are coming out. Proverbs um, 29 11, just kind of to speak further to this point, says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. They're saying, Look, if you're a fool, you're just going to speak all, anything that, that's in your mind, you're just going to blah, blah, speak it out. Okay, 
But it says a wise man's going to keep it in until afterwards. You're going to wait a second. You're going you're to think about it. Thank you. You're welcome. And you're going to keep it in until afterwards. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 28, it says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So he's saying, look, if you're a fool and, and you have foolish things that would come out of your mouth, if you just don't say anything, if you hold your peace, if you don't speak, the Bible says you're going to be counted as someone who's wise. I mean, people won't know it then because... In order to know that you're a fool, they're going to have to hear you speaking and hear you talking to understand, hey, yeah, that guy's a fool. That guy's, that guy's saying things that, uh, you know, but if, he, if you're able to hold your peace, if you're able to just, just shut up for a minute and, just, and, and not just say the first thing that comes to your mind, hey, you'll be counted, you'll be counted as someone that's wise. Um, Ephesian, or Ecclesiastes 5.3, I'm going to close on this verse. It says, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Again, I mean, over and over again in Proverbs, Proverbs talks a lot about fools and wisdom and learning knowledge. And, um, you know, our tongue is, is it's, it's a big deal. I mean, it, there's a lot of things that we can do with our mouth, with our conversation. There's a lot of power in our words, more than we probably realize sometimes. There's a lot that goes out. I mean, and there's even more power in God's word. If you think about this, Think about the amount of power that is in God's word, right? It truly is wondrous when you think about God created the, just in the entire creation, everything, the universe, us, the animals, everything that exists with his word. God spake it into existence. That's how powerful God's word is. All the stuff that's here today exists because of the fact that God just spake something that came out of his mouth and boom, there it is. God's word the Bible says that God's word was made flesh. God's word died for us. God's word is that powerful. God's word was able to become flesh, become a human being, die on the cross for our sins, and give us salvation and give us eternal life. That's how powerful God's word is. And by the way, it's God's word that gets people saved out soul winning. It's not our own. It's not my explanation. It's not, it's not my own words that I bring to them. The Bible says it's God's word. God's word is what's going to get somebody saved. The seed that you're planting when you go out soul winning, it's God's word that we're planting in that person's soul and in that spirit. His word is powerful. The Bible says God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide under the soul and spirit. It's able to, to pierce right to your heart. God's word is powerful. I mean, this, these words, the, the things that are written in this book, have been, have been you know, the reason why a lot of people go to war and kill other people and just do all things just because of words that are written in this book. People hate them. I mean, the words that Jesus spake. Did Jesus do anything wrong to anybody? I mean, did he wrong any person while he lived on this earth? No. All he did was speak. He preached. He used his voice. Words came out of his mouth and he was killed for it. People hated those words so much that they destroyed him. They... they, they did all kinds of evil to him. And it was because of his words. Our words, they can start fights. They can get us into sin. Our words can cause other people to sin. The things that we say, we can cause other people to get into sin. Our words can cause a lot of damage. As the Bible said, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. This is why it's so important to have a filter. Think about the things that you say. Make sure that the things that you're saying are true and are right. We all ought to think about these things. How do they line up with the Bible? Is, is what I'm saying pleasing to God? Is what I'm saying, are things coming out of my mouth, is that something that, that's right? Is it just? As the opening verse said, and this is why we started off in Psalms, right? That verse says, if I can find that verse, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. You have to purpose it in your heart. You have to decide, am I going to try to tackle this problem? Am I going to try to, to watch my mouth and not sin based on the things that are coming out of my mouth? It has to be purposed in your heart. Then you can make sure that your mouth does not transgress through the multitude of ways that it can transgress. 
Don't be talking about sin. Don't be joking about it. Don't be getting other people to sin. Don't be saying things that are lies. There's so many different things we need to be careful of and watch. And don't be around other people that have filthy conversation because it's going to rub off on you. If nothing else, it's going to vex your soul, and that's not good for you either. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for these great warnings. I thank you for the language that you use to really drive it home and to, and to make us pay attention and, and to look at these things carefully and look at them more closely, dear Lord. Um, how you tell, how you explain and, and you use the wonderful, colorful language of, um, of how great a, a matter of fire kindleth in association with our tongue, dear Lord. It really helps us to understand how, um, how wide affecting our tongues can be and truly how much damage they can do. And, um, and also how much good they can do, dear God, if we're going out and speaking the right things and, and preaching your word, dear Lord. And um, I just pray that you would please help us all to, to create and maintain a filter in our minds that we can filter the things that come to our, that, that just pop into our head, that we don't just speak them immediately. Um, and especially in, in times of, of great emotion, dear Lord. Help us to restrain ourselves. Help us to be temperate and, and moderate and be able to control the things that come out of our mouth so that we don't say hurtful things that we don't really mean. And Lord, all of these things we pray through Jesus Christ's name. Amen.